Where you live influences what you eat. Sounds pretty simple, but there's a lot to it. So joining us with more on what this all means is Leah Miniker. She's a scientist at the Propel Center for Population Health Impact at the University of Waterloo. Hello, welcome to the agenda. All right, Leah, I want to begin uh, by reading something from your bio on your university, University of Waterloo's website. Here's what it said you uh, undertook to do. You, Leah, examined environmental determinants of diets and obesity at a population level, working with urban planners and public health practitioners to develop policies supportive of healthy built environments. Okay, I want to pull that apart a bit and just ask you, what does it all mean? So when I first started as a PhD student, I sat down with urban planners in the region of Waterloo. Uh, and I said, you know, basically I, I have four or five years to work on something and I want to do something that's useful and meaningful for you. And I care about food and I care about our environments and determinants of what we eat. And so what can I do that would be most useful? And region of Waterloo is a really progressive uh, region. And so they are the first municipality in Canada actually to include language in their regional official plan about uh, local food and, and protecting agricultural land so that it's sustainable food and that kind of thing. So, uh, so when they said, you know, we have this language in our official plan about wanting to make healthy food environments, we just don't know how to measure it and what that means yet. So when a developer comes to us and says, we want to develop this new community, we don't know how to tell them how to build healthy food access into our communities. And so that's where I went. Okay, you said something called um, a food environment. Yes. What is that? So food environment is, I mean, really generally, when we think about the environment, we think of anything outside of ourselves that influences us. And so there are people, for example, who look at food environments in homes. So whether, you not, whether or not you have a fruit bowl in your kitchen versus a bag of cookies open in your kitchen. There are people who look at school food environments and nutrition policies in schools. And I specifically look at the retail food environment. So looking at geographic access to different kinds of foods, uh, as well as what is in the consumer nutrition environment. So what is it when people get to their food destination that they're experiencing? So when they go to their restaurant, are people saying, do you want apple slices with that? Or are they saying, do you want fries with that? Mm. Okay, I want to go through a couple of other terms that you talk about. Food desert, not dessert. What is a food desert? So food de desert is usually, uh, people think of it, about it as a low income or disadvantaged area with inadequate access to healthy food sources. So think about a low income neighborhood with no grocery store and no farmer's market, no fresh fruit and vegetables. Okay. If I think of no grocery store, no farmer's market, what was the other one? No, no fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables. Okay. When I look at, um, well, we, we could look at the province as a whole, but what, let's look at Southern Ontario. When I look at Southern Ontario, I mean, when you look at it, do we have such things as food deserts? So not really, mm. they're not widespread. And from data from across the country, studies that have been published in Canada show that in general, in Canada we have lower income areas have as good or better access to grocery stores than higher income areas. And that's very different than the story that's coming out of the United States. Meaning that, that in low income areas they don't have access to, that's right. to, to grocery stores with good nutritious food. Why is it different here? I don't know why it's mm. different. I think we have planned our cities a little bit differently than they have. I think the wealth disparity is a little bit different here in Canada as well. Um, so in, for example, in Detroit, uh, when people, more affluent people started moving out to the suburbs and then the grocery stores moved along with them. And so and the access to transportation is poor. So you have these low income clusters in areas with no access to fresh food. In Canada, we don't have the same kind of uh, disparity, I don't think. Okay. Another term, food swamp. Yes. What's that? So food swamp is similarly a low income or disadvantaged area, but with really high access to sources of unhealthy food. So typically uh, fast food outlets and convenience stores. Okay. So you got, I won't name them because I'll get in trouble for naming specific fast food restaurants, but you don't have a lot of good food uh, choice options, but you got a lot of unhealthy ones. Yeah. So it's actually independent of whether or not there's a grocery store. It's looking specifically at those sources of unhealthy foods. So you can have a food desert and a food swamp in the same neighborhood. It's just that the area of focus is a little bit different. So we're, whereas with food deserts, we're focusing on people's access to fresh, healthy food. With food swamps, we're focusing on people's access to energy dense junk food, basically. Okay. Do we have a problem with food swamps in Southern Ontario? Yes, I would say so. So where? A lot of places, <laughs> and this is consistent across the country. So the majority, not everywhere, but the majority of studies that have been done have found that lower income neighborhoods have way higher access to fast foods and convenience stores than uh, uh, higher income areas. And this is because it's cheap and convenient. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
when we look at, you know, when we often talk about um, how we split demographically, especially when it comes to food, we talk about uh, urban, rural versus remote. How do food environments change depending on the community? So in urban areas, uh, we have generally, pretty, people have pretty good access to food, um, to both sources of High, high access to both grocery stores and the less healthy sources of food like fast food and convenience stores. In rural areas, similarly, people, if they are within driving distance of an urban area, generally food distribution is still good and they can still access healthy food. But in the remote northern communities, there are, I mean, absolutely food deserts that exist up in the remote northern communities where it costs you know, $9 for a bag of spinach or $15 right. for a bag of apples. We did a show once, I think we are talking about a Calvet, obviously not mm -hmm. Northern Ontario, but I think a cabbage costs like 35 bucks for yeah. one cabbage. It's hard to imagine this happens in Canada. Yeah. Okay, I wanna um, talk about one of the findings from your thesis that you did. And here's uh, one of the things that you, not your findings, but one of the things that you talked about in your thesis. Here's what uh, I wanna talk to you about. Food availability has increased over the past few decades with approximately up to 530 more calories available in 2002 than in 1985, mainly in the form of, and this is important, salad oils, wheat flour, soft drinks, and shortening. Explain this phenomenon to me. So basically, I think when we, a lot of times when people think about the problem of obesity, for example, or the problem of poor diets in Canada and diet-related chronic disease, which is, I mean, a huge contributor to chronic disease and mortality in Canada and healthcare costs, uh, people think that what you eat is your own choice and there's a lot of stigma attached, especially to obesity and to other sort of diet-related chronic diseases. And so what I like to sort of throw as a factoid out there is that there's, you know, over 500 more calories available. Um, and, and that has substantially increased over the last few decades in parallel with obesity. And so it wasn't my choice that there's now 500 more calories available than there was 20 or 30 years ago, and it wasn't your choice. But the fact is that we live in this environment now that makes that food all the more available to us, and it's cheaper as well. And so the fact is that, that obesity is a totally logical response to our current food environment. Okay, someone's at home watching this eating a bag of chips or maybe some carrots and saying, come on, Leah, what we put on our own bodies is our own individual choice. That you have, you yourself said, we're in a pretty good situation in a lot, a lot of this province where we have choices. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? So I was thinking about this on my drive to work the other day and I was thinking, you know, I chose which roads to drive on to get to my job. I did not choose which roads to put in my city, and I did not choose what, how, what the traffic would be like on that day, and I didn't choose the speed limits on those roads. So to some extent, I had a choice of how to get there, but I didn't choose the structure, so my choice was constrained. And I would say the same thing with food. We have the choice, no one's putting a gun to our head when we were gonna put something in our mouth, but at the same time, we didn't choose that sugary cereals are gonna be marketed to our kids at eye level, so they pester us until we buy it. And we didn't choose that um, healthier foods are often much more expensive than less healthy foods, and that billions more dollars go into marketing unhealthy foods than they do healthy foods. So, so our choices are all constrained. That's a good analogy. By the way, we'll be talking about where sugary cereals are put on our shelves uh, just later on in the program. All right, so we started our conversation. You went to the city of Waterloo, said like, I wanna look at this food environment thing. Mm -hmm. They said, yes, go do it. Your universe said yes. At the end of your thesis, what did you conclude? So we found a few interesting things. So we looked at, I looked at um, things like geographic proximity. So where's the nearest convenience store? Where's the nearest fast food outlet, grocery store? But I also looked at, we went into every independently owned restaurant and every independently owned food store, as well as every grocery store and one of each chain restaurant and food store to look at what are people being marketed within the food environment. So what's being advertised on the walls, what things are cheaper than other things in terms of healthier versus less healthy, healthy options and what's the shelf space. And so, one of the, our findings was that there's over three times as much shelf space, just linear shelf space, dedicated to energy dense junk food basically as there was to fruits and vegetables. And if you think about a lot of times junk food is multiple layers, it's probably if there's four shelves, it's probably more like 12 times as much because fruits and veg are often just on one layer. I see one level, they're not piled up. Exactly. Okay. Um, so even just in terms of the shelf space, we're being marketed much more heavily than energy-dense foods. The other thing, one of our main findings was that 
um, the closer you live to the nearest convenience store, the more likely you are to be more overweight. And so, and that was particularly true for women. So I think it was an average height woman, about 5'5". Five, five. For every kilometer closer she lived to the nearest convenience store, she was on average about 13 pounds heavier. 13 pounds ever per, per kilometer. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And then the other thing we found was that the affordability, the relative affordability. So whether the healthier option is more or less expensive also is strongly associated with people's body mass index and waist circumference. Okay. Short of closing down convenience stores um, close to my house and other women's house, yeah. what do you want to see happen to change the influence of our uh, environment on the food choices that we make? There's a lot of interesting stuff going on across the country right now and, and here in Toronto as well. So. Um, right now we're pilot testing a healthy corner store program in low income neighborhood in, in lo a low income neighborhood in Toronto. And so we're looking specifically at how can we develop a program that will link small food retailers with the great resource of the food terminal here where they can get wholesale priced beautiful fruits and vegetables and sell them in these smaller food retail places that typically sell your sort of vices like tobacco gambling and, and junk food. Um, and do so in a way that's financially, financially feasible for the corner store owner. So there's that. And then there's a lot of municipal work going on across the country now in terms of things like community gardening and urban agriculture and other ways of trying to bring healthier foods into places where they haven't been typically. Okay, I want to go back to your convenience store that has healthy food. I walk into this store in Toronto. What am I going to see on the shelves? You'll see fresh food on shelves. It's still in the pilot phases. So we're trying to figure out, we're working with a marketing firm right now to figure out exactly how to market healthy food and how to brand it because... It seems pretty simple. It's good for you. Eat it. Yes. And the health message doesn't... Health is important to some people. I've realized this as well. Nutrition is really important to people who make nutrition recommendations. Nutrition is not important to everyone and also not easily understood by everyone. And so what re really resonates with people, I think, is that it tastes really good. Mm. Um, but sometimes it's easy to get caught in the trap of thinking that health and nutrition matters to everyone, and it just doesn't. Okay, we've sort of tipped our hat to this talking about individual responsibility, and, and we are going to be talking more about where responsibility should lie with government, with individuals, with the, the, the um, stores themselves. But I want to ask you, when you look, um, when you're doing your thesis and you're looking around more generally, is there a particular group that you can point to or a couple that are leading the charge in our city and in, in our province in terms of improving the food environment? Yeah. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> there's a few different uh, examples that stand out to me. One of them is, again, here in Toronto, with the, there's, and in Ottawa as well, there's a mobile good food market that's going around to different underserved lower income neighborhoods where they don't have access to grocery stores and selling this beautiful produce at an affordable price to people. And I guess that's the key, right? Because we can get beautiful produce at sort of the higher end grocery stores, but mm -hmm. it's most often not at an affordable price for most that's people. That's right. And it's also for people who have no or limited access to transportation. So if you have to take a bus to the grocery store, chances are you won't buy a watermelon because you're going to have to carry the watermelon back with you on the bus or a 10 pound bag of potatoes or a four liter bag of milk. So it's about making healthier choices defaults for people rather than something that they really have to try and strive for. Because I mean, for everyone who's made a New Year's resolution to eat better this year and probably has already failed at least once <laughs> or twice, um, I think it would be really interesting if stores started making New Year's resolutions and deciding we're going to have a candy-free checkout aisle or we're going to not put so much sugary cereal at kids' um, eye level or we're going to do things that will incentivize people or make it easier or a default option for them to choose healthier choices. Okay, let me bring the government um, in this because there are a lot of calls. We look at New York, for example. The former mayor said, you know, I want to ban a certain size of soft drink. That was, he was unsuccessful in doing that. Do you think, I mean, short of doing that, do you think it's a good idea for governments to um, place limits uh, on the exposure of, of the, what citizens can have? In, in other words, to less healthy food cho choices. Do you think the government should say, you know what, we're going to step in here. We're going to make this harder. That's a great question. I think it's something for the public to, to debate. Um, I think that in general voluntary regulation, self-regulation of the industry doesn't work and that's been shown in the literature as well. Um, when Campbell's for example took out their the salt from their soups, uh, they, the sales of those soups went down because they didn't taste as good anymore so they slowly started adding the salt back in. Um, so 
voluntary self-regulation doesn't work. But if we as a society think that it's important that the playing field is a little more equal in terms of not spending as much money on marketing, for example, or banning advertising to certain segments of the population that don't know that it's advertising like children, um, then I think that would be a really interesting thing. I think right now what's much more politically feasible and palatable is to improve people's access to fresh, healthy food rather than to ban anything or to restrict anything. Do you think the big uh, retailers and the people that you know make a lot of money off sugary cereals, I mean, how do we get, it's sort of like talking about big tobacco, right? And it's, trying to get yeah. them to sign on to get people to smoke less. This is a difficult task ahead. Yes, yeah, it's, it's exactly like talking about big tobacco because although the difference is with tobacco, there's no safe level of consumption. With food, there is a safe level of consumption and it's confusing for people, especially in the middle sort of section where it's not broccoli and it's not a bag of chips. It's sort of somewhere in the middle. What's in between broccoli and a bag of chips? <laughs> I know. Broccoli flavored chips. Exactly. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's a colleague in uh, New Zealand who's developed an app that's helping people to navigate their food environments, which I think is really interesting and I would love to see it in Canada. It's called Food Switch App. And you basically scan a barcode in your grocery store and it will tell you along these either salt or sugar or calories or fat. Um, what option might be healthier that's on the same aisle. So this jam has this much or sugar in it, and this jam that's right beside it has a lot less sugar, so you might want to make the healthier choice there. Can I just make a plea before we go? I'm going to let you go. To people who are on their phones, you say, let's use an app in a grocery store, park your cart to the side of the aisle. I'm always running into the back <laughs> of people because they've got their phone out and they're looking at their groceries. That's my plea, people. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.